Welcome back to another video lecture. Today we begin our study of the United States' first major war, the Great War, or World War I, from 1914 to 1918. Remember that we had previously studied uh, briefly the American-Spanish or the Spanish-American War of 1898 to 1899-1900. That was a more localized affair, although we did acquire the Philippine Islands in the Pacific. But at this point, we're going to turn our attention to what becomes America's real, I would say, entry onto the world stage of, of power and uh, prominence uh, for the United States. So the first thing to understand um, is this, as we look at the background and context that you see up there, we have to remember that this was a European affair. It was a European war. Um, the major uh, European empires of Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, in addition to the Republic of France and the British Isles, and you can see all of those nations listed here in this map of Europe about the time of World War I, uh, were, were kind of engaged in a century, I don't want to say a century long, but at least, you know, 40, 50 years, uh, 60 years of struggles, not outright war, but struggles and conflicts as each of them began to embrace industrialization, uh, a capitalist society. They began to search out for empires in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific, in the South Atlantic, uh, in the Caribbean. So that there was really a period of intense activity um, in Europe that really, by the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, had created a very intense competition between nations for territories, for natural resources, for prestige, and for outright power. And this is really kind of the background and context that we need to understand um, if we're going to make sense of World War I. So while this is not a European history class and we're not looking to really understand the causes of World War I, uh, we do need to just keep these basic things in mind. The other thing I think we need to look at um, with regards to the late 1800s, um, that this was a time of great European um, progress, material progress, industrial progress, wealth, accumulation. There was a great rise in art, in architecture, science, philosophy, medicine, and all sorts of new techniques. So Europe is really um, kind of at the cutting edge, uh, the leading edge of culture, of industry, of innovation. And of course, the United States is right behind as it had developed as we studied intensively. But at this point, Europe really is kind of at the height of its creativity and was by all accounts the center of the world. Many people wanted to visit Europe and many wealthy Americans did. Uh, people came from all parts of the globe to come and visit different European capital cities, uh, London or Berlin, Paris, um, Amsterdam, Rome, so on and so forth, Vienna, uh, not to forget the Austrian-Hungarian -Hung Empire. Yet there's really an odd thing too, at the same time we had this great uh, um, sense of achievement in many different fields, there was also a sort of black cloud that was suspended above Europe that led to a pessimistic out attitude. Uh, that pervaded the thoughts of many. And in fact, the chief German general, Helmuth von Moltke, great name, uh, declared, and I quote, a European war is bound to come sooner or later, and then it will, in the last resort, be a struggle between Teuton, that is Germans, and Slav. And we can look at the idea of race that we just discussed with the problems and limitations of progressivism here. Uh, Russia and the tiny nation of Serbia that you see down there were both Slavic nations. They were Southern and or Eastern European nations. They were not what you would call the typical European stock, um, though they are part of Europe, undoubtedly. Uh, they were uh, of a different ethnic group, and um, the Europeans in the West, uh, especially the Northwest, again, Protestant and white, uh, felt that the Slavs were inferior. And, and the German general von Moltke really, I think, captures the idea of what was at play when we talk about World War One, and really Germany was trying to stake out, carve out a position of dominance within Europe uh, at the expense really of Russia and its vast territories and you can see on the map just how large Russia was and uh, Russia's other uh, friends and or allies. 
You see on the map there a bunch of arrows, um, crudely drawn, no doubt, and I tried to use different colors. But if we look at the map, let's start with Russia on the right-hand side, that is in the east. Uh, Russia was... Uh, allied with France. And you can see that arrow connecting Russia and France. France, in turn, was allied with Great Britain. And, and so the Russia, France, and Great Britain, three nations, form what was known as the Allied uh, or Entente Powers. Um, and they were then uh, in opposition to Germany, the center part of northwestern Europe there, and Austria-Hungary. Uh, another large empire itself. So you had, uh, on one hand, the Allied Powers, uh, three, Russia, France, and England, or Great Britain, uh, against Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, and that's two, right in the center of Europe. And you can see that uh, the Germans are kind of surrounded. So that was one of the things that uh, caused the Germans uh, some concern. Later, you would have Italy. Italy had uh, signed an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary, although it was a defensive alliance, um, and the Italians, uh, as they're wont to do, uh, easily break alliances as the, the, the times demand. And so Italy is going to eventually join Britain, France, and Russia. The United States, in fact, will join Britain, France, and Russia uh, down the road. Um, so at that point, we have uh, a look at this map. I hope this uh, kind of explains the two different sides involved in the European war. Um, I forgot to mention, I think, that Germany and Austria-Hungary, they were called the central powers because they occupy the central part of the European map. So moving along, uh, we see that uh, war comes to Europe. Um, and that happened really uh, during the summer of 1914. And you see several of the key figures uh, here on the left, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and one of his uh, close associates, and you can see them in full military uniform, love the German Pickelhalber, which is that uh, helmet with a spike on top. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, Tsar Nicholas of Russia. And those two, uh, in fact, that blue line, um, I drew to indicate that they were related. They were actually cousins, which was not uncommon. Many of the ruling... Um, um, monarchs or emperors were in fact related. So uh, this is the situation. Um, the summer of 1914, on June 28th, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a man named Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated as he visited uh, parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in, in particular in Bosnia, um, along with his pregnant wife, who um, was with him and accompanying him on this visit. And the person responsible for this assassination was a Serbian, again remember Slav, nationalist named Gavrilo Princeps. And the Serbian nationalists, those, and nationalists mean somebody who just loves their country ardently, uh, felt threatened by Austria. Austria was a big neighbor to the north, and if I flip back to the map, you can see Serbia is, is kind of very hard to pick out there, but I drew an arrow to it. Serbia is a very small landlocked country uh, in the center of southern Europe. Austria-Hungary was really putting a lot of pressure on Serbia and the Serbians kind of resented that and a small group of nationalists um, embraced what today we would call terrorist tactics. So Gavrilo Princeps um, assassinates the heir to the Austrian uh, throne on June 28, 1914 and that was going to initiate a series of events that led to the outbreak of hostilities in Europe on August 4th, 1914. And in particular, Austria felt that the Serbian government was responsible, so Austria naturally um, threatened the Serbian government, prepared to invade and bombard the Serbian government, presented the Serbian government with a list of very uh, strict demands that the Serbian government was to meet. Um, at that point, Russia the protector of the Serbs, as you can see on the map there, intervened and promised to support and protect Serbia. At that point, Austria, uh, allied to Germany, uh, asked and received and obtained uh, the full support of the German Empire. Um, and what happened was uh, a series of maneuvers um, called mobilization. So when Russia 
it says that in, a, in effect it will protect the Serbs, it begins to call up its military forces, its army, uh, in what was known as mobilization. Well, as Russia begins to mobilize its army, Germany, uh, next door neighbor, as you can see, um, you know, mobilized its army. And when we talk about mobilization, it doesn't really mean much. You say, well, look, they call out their troops, they get them out of the barracks, they clean up their rifles, they begin to march and train. But there's another fact uh, that I think we need to understand, and I'll flip to that in just a second, and that is uh, this idea of war plans. And the Germans were really... Um, excellent at war plans. They spent a lot of time. In fact, the Schlieffen plan uh, was 20 years in the making, uh, developed by um, a man in the military German uh, staff, um, von Schlieffen. And you can see that the plan was there, Germany in the center of Europe, um, was going to invade France, going through Holland and Belgium, knocking out France, now, why would they want to do that? Well, remember that France was, in fact, an ally of Russia. So the Germans felt that France, being far more um, sophisticated, more industrial, and more advanced than Russia, that it would be in their best interest to defeat France quickly with a massive invasion. As you can see, all those arrows represent different troop formations. And then once having knocked out Russia's uh, ally, uh, France, uh, Germany could turn its attention then to... Uh, Russia and then defeat Russia. And you can see there that the, the French had kind of understood what the Germans were going to do and the French had built up a line of very uh, dense fortifications, forts with artillery and dug-in positions and that blue line you see there on the right-hand side of France was known as the Maginot Line. Well, of course, the Germans uh, uh, knew that that Maginot Line existed, and they went through Holland and Belgium. Now, Holland and Belgium were both neutral countries. They were not supposed to be uh, invaded by anybody, uh, and that wasn't going to happen. So what happened was exactly uh, what I just said, that um, as Russia mobilized its forces... Go back here, Tsar Nicholas II mobilized his forces, Kaiser Wilhelm mobilizes his forces, and they actually put into practice um, the Schlieffen Plan. Um, now, through all of this, uh, there was a series of diplomatic exchanges and telegrams. Uh, we don't have direct telephone service yet, but telegrams nonetheless. And there's an exchange of notes where Tsar Nicholas says, Hey, look, um, I'm calling off my mobilization order. In a sense, just kidding. Uh, thought about it, but not going to do it. Kaiser Wilhelm says, yeah, I'm not sure I really believe you. Can I believe you? Do I trust you? Hmm. Again, you can see sort of family uh, feuds uh, coming into play here. And Kaiser Wilhelm essentially says to the Austrians, look, go ahead. Take on, take, take down Serbia. Teach them a lesson. Uh, they deserve it. They had it coming to them. And we will back you fully. In fact, we expect you to do so. So uh, basically, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, doesn't believe Tsar Nicholas. And, and what happens is the outbreak of hostilities. So are you confused at this point? I wonder. I hope that you have some questions. In fact, I would like you to write down three questions. Uh, bring them to class on Monday that you can ask. I will check them, and and then we can uh, move on from there because this is a bit confusing, but I think the context is, is useful and necessary. So the next question is, okay, we're studying American history. Let me flip through there. What does this mean for the United States? Well, in the uh, summer of 1914, uh, one historian, Paige Smith, wrote, uh, writes that although, as we have noted, Europe seethed with rumors and alarms of war, Great Britain and the United States remained undisturbed. So I thought, why not show something like this? Blue skies, nothing but blue skies. The United States and its close ally, Britain, really didn't think much of what was going on in Europe. They didn't really pay attention to it. And that really kind of goes back to the idea of George Washington, our first president, who in his famous farewell address said that the United States should avoid getting involved in the affairs of Europe in particular. The Europeans tended to fight a lot, feud a lot over petty things, the United States would be better served if it just stayed out of the way. And the United States also had the other uh, a great thing going for it, or another 
thing going for it, and that is geography. We had two great oceans, both the Atlantic and the Pacific, that isolated us from the rest of the world. So President Woodrow Wilson, uh, in fact, on August 19th, two weeks out after the outbreak of hostilities, addresses the nation in a stirring speech in which he declares the official policy uh, of neutrality. And with that, we'll pick up on Monday. Thank you.